Hi everyone, and welcome back to part three on constraints in optimization for machine learning. What we have discussed until now is the idea of, well, why do we even need constraints, right? There can be many reasons, like numerical reasons. We have seen the ridge regression last video. Um, we might want to include physics constraints and so on. And then we have seen actually that it's not so easy to, to use the gradient as we know it, but you have to derive uh, an additional condition. Okay, and what we have seen in part two of this, these three videos on constraints is that we have this transformation from a constraint problem. And what we did is we had this rich regression idea. So minimize a squared error function subject to the radius of the weights basically, or the, let's say the budget of the weights is constrained. And then we derived in a picture-like fashion this condition where we said, okay, the constraint is basically transformed into an additional term in the loss function. And we also saw if you take the derivative of, the, of this loss function, you actually determine or rediscover this condition that the gradient of the loss function and the gradient of this constraint function are collinear. Okay, and then this lambda is basically this, the proportionality constant that scales them so that the gradient can be zero in this optimal point. And so in the general setting, we do not have this, well, this is this is the budget constraint now. In the general setting, we have arbitrary inequality constraints, which are denoted by lower case C, and we have N I of them generally. And we have these equality constraints C hat, also lower case C, same way, but now we have this equality instead of the inequality. And we have N E of those. And what we introduced rather artificially, this idea about the collinearity, is something that we now want to formalize. And we're not going to study the proof, um, but more give the conditions. And then I would like to take the rest of this video to discuss the meaning of these individual lines in, in the conditions and what they mean and how they work in this pictorial uh, description, again, of the same setting as we had in the video before. So what we want to see, or what we, what we will use, is what is very, very well known in the optimization literature as the Carouche kuhn tucker conditions. Or KKT. But these are the optimality conditions for constraint problems that were discovered by Kuhn and Tucker in the 50s, I think. And then later I was found out that in a bachelor thesis by Carouche, this had been discovered, I guess, more than 10 years earlier already. So nowadays Carouche and Kuhn and Tucker uh, developed these or identified these individually. And so here's the condition. I'm, as I said, I'm not going to show any proof of it, but um, again, you can look to Nossedal and Wright if you're interested. But what we will see is that these conditions really generalize the idea of the derivative being zero in optimum in a local minimum. So these are again necessary conditions, not sufficient conditions, so that this point can be a minimizer. And what they mean is, or how they start, is the gradient of the loss function. That has to be zero, but not in on its own. What we have in addition is we have additional terms that account for the constraints. And you can guess it, it will look something like this, as we have seen in this specific setting. So what we first have is a sum over all the inequality constraints. So I'm going from E equals one to Ni over the, uh, the inequality constraints. And I have these multipliers. And I have the derivative or the gradient of the constraint. Okay, so you recognize this, this is exactly this description for ni equal to one and the little k c being w transpose w minus c. So that it fits into this setting. Okay, but this is only half the truth. We now only have the inequality constraints. So what I need is a second sum, j going from one to ne, so the number of equality constraints, and it looks basically in the same way. So we have a mu here, and then we have again the gradient of the cj hat of w star. Okay, so you see very, very similar structure. Um, 
going to tell you in a second why there are more conditions that I, this is why I left some space here, why these differ in the end. Okay, so what do we have in addition? This one, oh sorry, this one has to be zero obviously in order to be an optimal point, right? So we have, this has to be zero, so if I neglect constraints, I get gradient has to be zero. So the special case of unconstrained optimization is included. If I ignore these, one, uh, these ones, I will find this condition, but there's more to this um, setting. So what we also have is that the inequality constraint has to hold, right? So what we had is the CI of W star has to be smaller or equal to zero, right, for i to ni, right? So this just means the grade has to be zero, but also obviously the constraints have to be satisfied, otherwise this could be an arbitrary point. We have the same that the equality constraints have to be met, which means that I have j of these conditions. Right, so basically nothing new. And now follow a few additional conditions. So one is on the inequality constraints, and I'm going to comment on this in a second. So what we in addition have that these lambda j, so the KKT multipliers, the, so the coefficients in front of the inequality, oh, sorry, here's a j missing, and in front of the equality constraints, that there are additional conditions, but only for the inequalities. So these lambda i's, have to be positive, right? Lambda i is greater than zero for all i's from one to n i. And last but not least, we have what's called the complementarity condition. So the product of lambda i and c i of w star has to be zero for all of these. Okay, again, i from one and I. Okay, now this looks like a, a mess, let's say, but actually there's quite a lot of structure to this. As I said, this is the key condition, okay? Gradient has to be zero, and then in addition the gradient plus multipliers times the derivatives of the constraints, okay? And so the case of equality constraints is actually quite simple. So let's for now, for a second, forget about this one and forget about these ones. Okay, why? Equality constraints seem fairly simple, right? This would mean also this one goes away here. And what we're left with is gradient of the loss function plus multiplier times gradient of the constraint. And so in the video before, we have been talking about the fact that, well, if the constraint is really active, which means that the minimizer of the loss function, right, again here this green one is our loss function, and the orange one is our constraint. If the constraint is too loose, let's say the minimizer of the unconstrained loss is inside this, this inequality constraint, then we don't really care about the constraints. And this is what these, well, these, these terms in bracket will account for. But for now, let's say we do have an equality constraint, which is a simplified setting because the constraint has to hold, right? So this line has to hold. And so what we've seen that in this case, we really have the situation that we had before, okay? So the gradient has to look something like this, pointing towards the steepest direction. And the derivative of the constraint has to point in the opposite direction. So this is exactly what we have seen here, right? This derivative is plus mu, times this derivative and you have to sum them up to zero, okay? So this would mean a small gradient, a larger constraint, so let's say roughly 0 0.5 times this plus this gives us zero, okay? So this one's very, very easy and all the additional terms are required because inequality constraint problems tend to be a little bit more messy, but still fairly, fairly similar, okay? Now let's reconsider these inequality constraints. We start here, the condition is basically the same, but we now have these additional constraints here. So this one, the last one, let's start with this one. What does this really tell us? This tells us either 
the multiplier is zero or the constraint itself is zero. Right? Let's say the multiplier is zero, which means this one goes away and the according point in the sum goes away. Okay? So if we have a lambda that is zero, this means the constraint is not of any interest. It's inactive. And so this is a particularly interesting or practical situation because you just, we just don't care, right? This is a situation when the constraint is inside, okay? This one has a positive uh, value, uh, excuse me, a negative value, so it's inside the constraints, but because of this multiplier being zero, so if this is really non-zero, so it's strictly negative, this condition tells us, okay, then the multiplier has to be zero, which means the point, the minimum lies in the interior, this constraint doesn't matter. If, on the other hand, the multiplier is non-zero, so a positive number, which is enforced by this line, then we can say, okay, on the other hand, the constraint has to be equal to zero, which means only if the multiplier is non-zero, then we do actually have an active constraint, right? Because meaning the aim inequality constraint being precisely zero, this would mean that this condition is met with equality, then in fact, the inequality constraint becomes an equality constraint. So in the same way, right? And this means, okay, these additional lines make it look a little bit complicated, but still it really is, let's say, a matter of case sensitivity, if you wish, okay? So for equality constraints, it's just that simple. And for inequality constraints, it's also that simple, except for we have to decide between different cases. If the constraint is inactive, meaning that the lambda i is zero, then basically this constraint doesn't matter because we have a situation like this, okay? So we inside the minimum, we don't care. If the constraint on the other hand is active, this means the lambda i is greater than zero, strictly, right? This condition tells us greater or equal, sorry, this one. But equality is the inactive case, this one. This again means that the ci belonging to this is equal to zero. So it in fact becomes an equality constraint. So the whole difficulty of treating inequalities becomes due to the fact that we need to differentiate between a constraint being active and being inactive. And so I hope this helps you to make a lot of sense. One can in fact rigorously prove that these are necessary conditions for optimality for this type of problem, okay? If these conditions are met, then we have a point that satisfies the necessary optimality conditions, right? And so getting rid of constraints simplifies things greatly, but in this most general form, we still see we can make sense of it, and there's a meaning to all of these, and there's a nice geometric interpretation of why um, these conditions have to be uh, the way they are. And this concludes our three videos on constraints. The next video is going to be about how to practically solve constraint optimization problems in two different ways. And thanks for watching and see you then.